Hello, my name is Mrinalini Day. I'm a clinical fellow from London in the UK, and I'm here with Room Now, um, reporting from ACR 2024 in Washington, DC. Um, thank you for joining us for this video. I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Chris Winkup, who is a uh, consultant rheumatologist and academic clinician working at King's College Hospital in London in the UK. And today we are going to be talking about neuropsychiatric lupus. Um, so for those of you who may have reviewed the program here at ACR, um, this is actually a relatively less spoken about set of symptoms. Um, and so I'm really interested to hear Chris's thoughts on neuropsychiatric lupus in general, but also what we can do to raise awareness of um, this particular manifestation of um, lupus, which is of course a very complex condition. So thank you for joining me, Chris. Um, so first of all, can you just tell the audience briefly about what is neuropsychiatric lupus? Sure, so neuropsychiatric lupus we can define relatively easily because the ACR has already done that. And it basically reports a number of symptoms that patients with lupus may suffer from involving the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And it's a fairly exhausted list of symptoms, but sometimes we consider that there may be symptoms beyond this that are not included within that criteria. So we know that we've got good definitions, they're very broad, but we know that patients can present in a number of different ways and it's often difficult as a clinician to delineate between what is neuropsychiatric lupus due to active lupus within the nervous system versus the side effects of medicine versus damage versus something else entirely. And I think that really does pose some of the challenges that we see when treating patients with these symptoms, but perhaps more importantly, identifying those symptoms. Okay. So just picking up on that last point, so identification of symptoms, a lot of our audience are going to be practicing clinicians. Um, how can we better identify um, these symptoms? And I know there's been a large body of work done in the UK recently about this. So uh, if, if you want a one word answer is how do we better identify these symptoms, uh, that, that is ask. Uh, and I think asking about these symptoms is important. And I look at my own practice over, over recent years and uh, I've noticed the importance of asking about these symptoms. So I think sometimes as clinicians, uh, particularly rheumatologists looking after people with lupus, that you think that you would identify the rate of symptoms that, that patients are experiencing because we expect them to be fairly profound. So if a patient has a seizure, you would imagine that you would at least, if, they, if you don't see that patient have a fit, you would see it on their medical records. The patient may tell you they've had a hospital attendant with this. But from the research we've done, uh, we note that patients are often under-identified, even with fairly profound and obvious symptoms such as that. Now imagine you're looking at other symptoms, for example, hallucinations, mood disturbance, cognitive dysfunction, which are a lot more subtle then you really do need to inquire about these. And some of the work that we've done in the past has shown that many rheumatologists underappreciate how many of their patients with lupus experience these symptoms. And when I first saw the data, I, I thought, well, this can't be true that many patients are reporting these symptoms. So I did a test myself and in clinic, I started asking patients questions I hadn't asked before. For example, have you suffered a hallucination? Uh, have you had uh, auditory hallucinations or visual or tactile hallucinations? How is your mood? And I think as rheumatologists, we often think that we, we encompass many of those in the questions that we do ask. And I'm surprised by the number of patients who do have these subtle symptoms that do very well at masking them because we're not asking about them. And I think some of that is a degree of, it is challenging for patients to talk about these very distressing symptoms. And so we must make an environment for patients to feel comfortable and that they'll be heard to talk about this. But I think as rheumatologists, we also have to take a look at ourselves and say, I find it very difficult to talk about these symptoms with patients because if they do say, I have got one of these symptoms, we're often under-trained and under-prepared to know what to do with this. And so close working relationships with psychiatry can also help. So to identify the symptoms, I'd say inquire, but you will inquire more easily and more confidently if you had good relationships with psychiatry and neurology to, to understand what to do when you identify these symptoms. Yes. Um, yeah, I know from my own uh, clinical practice, it is very difficult. And as you say, we don't get trained. So particularly, so I'm a fellow at the moment and we don't get trained about these symptoms. But I think actually reading about the work that's been done recently, I have tried harder to ask about these symptoms. And actually, I think patients really appreciate it. Um, so what can we do from a research standpoint to try and increase awareness in the research world? For, for, because clearly there, there's, it's an unmet need, uh, both in terms of how we treat these patients, identify these patients. Um, yeah, what can we do from, from the, the, the research side of things? 
So I think clinically, let's imagine you've got someone with severe neuropsychiatric lupus that is fitting or psychotic or has a lymphocytic meningitis. Uh, sometimes it's relatively easy clinically to say that's active neuropsychiatric lupus, but it can be challenging because some patients will have uh, possible other comorbidities. Could there be an infection in particular in the setting of meningitis? So I think I, I answer your question about research first and foremost saying clinically it's often very, very difficult, even with the most marked symptoms to quantify them. And we can see depending on which study you look at and which research has been done, the prevalence of these symptoms are vast when you compare different papers. So we know that we have these very good definitions from the ACR of what neuropsychiatric lupus is classified as, but we should be very, very accurate in terms of our research, but we're not. And I think that even if we're looking at these severe symptoms, it's difficult to quantify, you go to the slightly more subtle ones, such as cognitive dysfunction, mood disturbance, even hallucinations. I think that what we need to do is find a way of better quantifying this. So number one comes back to what I said before. You need to ask and do the studies where you try and accurately quantify. But number two, I think as a rheumatologist, we need something that we know that we can treat and make better. So for example, if you have someone who's got proteinuria, uh, you say they've got lupus nephritis and I will initiate treatment and if the proteinuria improves, I know I'm treating that patient effectively. With neuropsychiatric lupus, many patients have very normal labs, very normal investigations, even their CSF and MRI scans can be normal on very simple terms. So I think we need to have better biomarkers and imaging to fully quantify that this is due to an inflammatory component and therefore you quantify it better and importantly you empower clinicians to treat that better because you see something that's abnormal that you can make better. So I think research needs to focus on biomarkers mm -hmm when we have actually quantified these symptoms properly. And I think new imaging techniques that can pick up some subtle neuroinflammation, and there's a lot of very interesting work in MRI PET with different ligands going on at the moment, that may make clinicians feel more confident in asking about these symptoms and when identifying them, get the patient treated. So I think those are the areas we really need to focus on. Great. Um, we could talk about this all day, uh, and we have spent uh, time talking about this before. Um, but I think just to wrap up, um, can you maybe direct our audience to resources or particular landmark papers in this area that you feel that they should read if they want to know more? Sure. So, I, I, I mean, I don't like to self-promote, but I think one of, one of the papers that I was fortunate to work on was, was a piece of work published in Rheumatology a couple of years ago with Melanie Sloan as the first author, in which we asked patients how frequent these symptoms are. And then we also asked rheumatologists, neurologists and psychiatrists, how frequently do you think your patients with lupus have these symptoms? And just look at the figures. I would just say, look at those figures to start up to see how often we are wrong uh, in terms of where our prediction of the prevalence of these symptoms are compared with uh, the prevalence actually reported by patients. So I think that's very helpful. I think resources is really important and I think resources can take a number of forms but particularly patient support organisations. So Lupus UK back home in England and in the rest of the United Kingdom but also Lupus Europe are doing a lot of work uh, to try and help patients when they experience these symptoms and I think as clinicians we just need to talk about this more and make this more of an agenda of what we're doing particularly in the treatment of patients with lupus. Perfect, yeah, no, I am um, I definitely also as, as the reader I wasn't involved in the work but when I read that particular paper that Chris has referred to uh, I was very struck by those graphs so I would I would recommend uh, uh, listeners to go and uh, take a look at that particular paper well thank you for uh, chatting with me today Chris and um, if you'd like to know more about Room Now's coverage at ACR 2024 do go over to the Room Now website or you can follow me at Dr Miniday on X uh, thank you for listening <laughs>